Good afternoon. We're just going to give a few minutes for our, um, or a few seconds for our participants to join us. Welcome. Okay, let's get started and folks will continue to join us as we move forward. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jocelyn Kennedy, the Executive Director of the Harvard Law School Library. Delighted to welcome you to the Harvard Law School Library Faculty Book Talk series. This talk is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel. It takes about a week for it to appear there. You can check out our scholarship at Law Blog for more information. Thank you so much to Dean Manning for his generous support of these talks. And a big thank you to our team members, Maya Bergamasco, Anna Martin, Rachel Parker, and Teresa Knapp for putting together this series. We welcome your questions for our panelists and invite you to use the Q&A feature throughout the talk. Time is reserved at the end um, for our panel to engage with your questions. Please visit your local library or your local bookseller, including the Harvard Coop, for a copy of today's book, Lakefront, Public Trust and Private Rights in Chicago. To begin our program, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Professor Henry E. Smith, the Fessenden Professor of Law here at Harvard. He directs the project on the foundations of private law and writes primarily on the law of the law of economics of real and intellectual property with a focus on how property related institutions lower information costs and constrain strategic behaviors. He teaches here at Harvard in the areas of property, natural resources, remedies, and law and economics. Professor Smith, I'll turn it over to you for today's program. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you. And thank you for the introduction, uh, Jocelyn. Um, uh, I'm Henry Smith. I teach here at uh, Harvard and I'll be the moderator today for uh, this book talk at the library. Uh, it's about a wonderful new book uh, called Lakefront, uh, Public Trust and Private Rights in Chicago uh, by Joe Kearney and Tom Merrill. Uh, before starting, uh, let me join Jocelyn in thanking uh, uh, Maya Bergamasco and the rest of the staff at the library for making this event possible. Uh, and um, let, we, I will start with our esteemed authors. Uh, Joe Kearney is the Dean and uh, Professor of Law at Marquette University Law School. Uh, and Tom Merrill uh, is Charles Evan Hughes Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. Uh, they're the authors of this uh, wonderful book, and uh, they will be joined today by Carol Rose, who's the Gordon Bradford Tweedy Professor Emerita of Law and Organization at Yale Law School, and the Ashby Lowe's Professor of Water and Natural Resource Law Emerita at Arizona College of Law. And we're also joined by Richard Lazarus, our, uh, our very own, uh, who's the Howard and Catherine Abel Professor of Law uh, here at the Harvard Law School. Uh, and they will speak roughly uh, in that order. Uh, and so without uh, further ado, uh, or editorial comments of my own, which I'll save for later, I will uh, turn it over to Joe and Tom. Terrific. Thank you, Henry, and truly to all who have been involved in this. I'm going to proceed immediately to share my screen if all goes well here. And need to get back to the beginning. So I apologize for that. And is it appropriately showing? Yep. Just the book cover itself? Yep. Wonderful. So our book as has been said. Dean Carney, is, I'm so sorry, Dean Carney. Um, if you might, you might have to click the from the beginning uh, in the top left corner. Eric, do you want to make sure I do this right? We're going to stop sharing briefly. We're going to share again in case anyone's keeping score at home. Apologies. This is what I get for having made a last minute check as to whether a slide was in a particular order. Maya, is it correct now? Yep, everything looks great. Thank you. So our book, as has been said, is Lakefront, Public Trust and Private Rights in Chicago. Tom and I are both former longtime Chicagoans, but the book's focus 
on Chicago would have been well advised in any event. The number of important property law controversies, and is it advanced to the second slide now? I take yes. it. Thank you. The number of important property law controversies involving Chicago's lakefront is really quite extraordinary. And this map from the lakefront book gives you a sense of the areas of the city that it was necessary to discuss all the way from the north and Northwestern University and Evanston, Tom's former stomping ground, down to the far south side, my comparative advantage, I guess. The focus of the book, of course, is doctrinal, as is appropriate. The public trust doctrine is the greatest theme, demonstrating, perhaps not too well so far, that Harvard Law School graduates do not shirk from paralegal work. I'm primarily going to advance the slides this afternoon as I otherwise hand things over to Tom. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, let me begin with a few comments about the uh, genesis of the case that's gonna be um, the center of, of focus here, which is Illinois Central versus Illinois, decided in 1892, which is probably the, it's almost question, unquestionably the leading public trust uh, decision in the United States, uh, even today. Um, the case arises when the Illinois Central Railroad, which was chartered in 1852, was permitted to locate its line along the shore of uh, Lake Michigan, uh, culminating in the center of the city, uh, just south of the Chicago River. The reason the Illinois Central was permitted to uh, make this entrance into Chicago was because the railroad cut a deal with the city council uh, in which the um, railroad promised to build a breakwater uh, outside uh, its tracks and facilities uh, to protect the shoreline uh, uh, along Lake, along uh, Michigan Avenue, uh, which was badly eroded. The uh, uh, citizens of Chicago couldn't agree on who was supposed to pay for the uh, breakwater, so the city council decided that the railroad could pay for the breakwater. This uh, was not too pleasing to the wealthy landowners uh, who had properties along Michigan Avenue, seen on the far left side of this one slide, uh, because although they were happy to have a breakwater to protect the land from erosion, they did not like the idea of a noisy, smoky uh, railroad being imposed between them and their views of the lake. Uh, the slide also suggests that um, the railroad was able to construct uh, 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 not only a, a, a rail line on trestles in the lake with the breakwater just to the outside, but also had very substantial improvements at the, at the upper level of this slide north of Randolph Street between Randolph and the river. The reason for that in large part was because at the time the railroad uh, was constructed and uh, initially constructed in the 1850s, uh, everyone assumed that the bed of Lake Michigan uh, was actually owned by the riparian owners that had title to the land immediately adjacent on the shore. And so the city of Chicago uh, and the Illinois Central both rather liberally uh, uh, agreed that the railroad could engage in extensive landfilling uh, in the areas uh, where it had riparian rights. And so the uh, the depot and the, and the grain elevators and so forth that you've seen in this picture were constructed under that uh, understanding. Um, this uh, picture is roughly uh, 1865. Uh, as time went on, it became increasingly clear that the, uh, the Chicago River, which was the main harbor uh, for the city of Chicago, was becoming incredibly congested uh, and was not really adequate for the commercial uh, needs of the city. Uh, and so uh, uh, the attention uh, shifted to building some kind of outer harbor uh, that would uh, alleviate the congestion of the Chicago River. At roughly the same time, we're talking about the 1860s, uh, uh, some uh, savvy lawyers in Illinois and in Chicago also began to perceive that the understanding that the riparian uh, landowner had title to the submerged land was, was very likely to, to change with respect to Lake Michigan. Uh, uh, various uh, uh, developments in the law suggested to them that ultimately the state of Illinois would be held to have uh, title to the bed of the lake. Uh, this understanding gave rise to a number of schemes led by Chicago lawyers, including one uh, 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 Melville, uh, what's his name, uh, 
uh, the former future chief judge uh, uh, of the Supreme Court. Um, Melville Fuller. Fuller, sorry, yeah, a little block there. Melville Fuller, who was a Chicago lawyer, Harvard educated, according to Joe, uh, teamed up with some other lawyers uh, to try to get a grant from the state legislature to allow them to build an arbor, outer harbor. They nearly succeeded in 1867. Uh, and this greatly alarmed the Illinois Central because as we saw in the previous slide, uh, its rail line and improvements were largely built uh, either on landfill or on trestles in the lake. And if somebody else obtained uh, rights to build uh, in that area a harbor, this, their, their improvements would become surrounded by a potentially hostile enterprise and they might be um, uh, 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 impaired or even forced to vacate uh, their improvements. So the railroad solution in 1869 was to hire the best lobbyist available and uh, grease the state legislature with a bit of graft. And they succeeded in getting a grant of the submerged land uh, for themselves. The Illinois legislature gave the Illinois Central uh, a thousand acres of land for purposes of constructing uh, an outer harbor. Uh, previous slide uh, shows roughly, well, anyway, uh, the uh, configuration of the Illinois Central around this time. Um, the, um, uh, the Illinois Central uh, uh, proceeded uh, somewhat slowly to uh, capitalize on this grant. And a few years later in 1873, under very different economic circumstances, uh, uh, an alliance of downstate legislators and, and Chicago legislators succeeded in repealing uh, the Lakefront Act. Um, uh, so the Illinois Central, which was always well supplied with expensive lawyers, uh, was advised by his lawyers that this repeal was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court had held earlier in the 19th century that completed grants of property, even if procured by alleged fraud, uh, could not be rescinded uh, consistent with the Contracts Clause of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10. So from that time on, 1873 on, uh, it, uh, for the next uh, decade or two, the Illinois Central refused to acquiesce and the idea that uh, this grant had been repealed. Uh, and in fact, the railroad uh, continued to try to enhance its improvements uh, uh, on the lake uh, to capture more lake traffic uh, for itself. Eventually, uh, the situation became intolerable. Uh, the need for uh, a new arbor, outer harbor was becoming acute. Uh, and so uh, massive litigation was started. Uh, the parties included the, the railroad, the city, the state and even the United States government. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, litigation dragged on for some time. Uh, eventually, uh, the ruling uh, from the Chicago, the circuit court in Chicago was against the railroad. It appealed to the Supreme Court and, and the case wound its way to the Supreme Court. In 1892, uh, the Supreme Court rendered its decision uh, by a narrow four to three vote, rejecting the vested rights argument of the Illinois Central, the contracts clause argument, and uh, Justice Stephen Field, that wrote the majority's decision, uh, justified this repeal under a theory that had been uh, played a rather minor role in the briefing up to that point. Indeed, the railroad lawyers had not even dined to address the argument in their briefs. Uh, but Field held that the uh, repeal was permissible because the land in question, the submerged land under Lake Michigan, although it was owned, uh, it, the title was in the state of Illinois, it was a different title. It was not a title that allowed the Illinois legislature to wheel and deal and buy and sell uh, this land uh, like ordinary landowner would, but rather it was impressed by, by a trust. And the trust was ran in favor of the general public. Uh, uh, the public could not be denied uh, general access to this uh, resource for purposes of commerce, navigation, and fishing. Um, uh, fields, um, Field's opinion uh, uh, made a couple of things relatively clear. One was that the trust was embedded in the title that the, that the state held to the lake, uh, the submerged land of the lake, uh, uh, and, which meant it had a sort of indelible quality. The state as the property owner really couldn't get rid of the trust uh, no matter what, how it tried. And secondly, uh, the purpose of the trust was uh, to promote public access to uh, uh, the lake for navigation and fishing. Um, Field wrote that there was no problem with relatively small grants uh, of the submerged land for things like wharfs and docks and breakwaters because that would enhance the public's right uh, to access the lake, but a very large grant of a thousand acres such as that given to the railroad uh, 
uh, was impermissible because it would give a private entity, a uh, private for-profit corporation, the right to exclude the public uh, in ways that would be uh, potentially undesirable. Uh, the, um, there were a number of uncle unclear things about the field opinion. He didn't say what the source of law was for this trust. He didn't say who was entitled to enforce the trust. He didn't say who the trustee was. Uh, these uh, issues uh, moved toward uh, clarification, however, fairly shortly, because just two years after the Illinois Central case was decided, the Supreme Court in a case called Snively versus Bowlby, Rose out of Oregon, decided that although uh, there was a this lands of this nature were impressed by a public trust, uh, the details of, uh, of the public trust would be determined by state law rather than federal law. And uh, the Illinois Supreme Court then became the main expositor of the public trust doctrine, doctrine in Illinois. And the Illinois uh, uh, Supreme Court promptly rendered some clarifications. It said that the trustee was the state legislature, uh, which spoke for all of the people in the state. Uh, uh, enforcement was implicitly assumed to be in the state attorney general. Uh, and uh, the standard of review that courts would make of any challenge to the state legislature's implementation of the trust was to be one that gave very great deference to the term determinations of the legislature. These rulings uh, really gave rise to a long period of time, roughly 70 years, in which the public trust doctrine in Illinois really uh, had a rather minimal uh, nature. It really required, there was only two requirements if somebody wanted to engage in landfilling in Lake Michigan to enhance their property rights. One was you had to get a grant from the legislature of the submerged land that would allow you to engage in landfilling. And the second, you had to get an opinion of some sort from the Army Corps of Engineers that this uh, landfilling would not interfere uh, with public uh, navigation rights. So just to cite one illustration, Northwestern University uh, in uh, the early 1960s decided that it needed to greatly expand its uh, campus in Evanston. It got a grant from the legislature allowing them to do that. Uh, the uh, Army Corps said it wouldn't interfere with navigation. So here you see a picture of uh, Northwestern busily uh, doubling the size of its campus by engaging in landfilling in the lake. Uh, uh, this pattern of uh, sort of minimal uh, uh, enforcement of the public trust idea uh, persisted until roughly uh, 1970. 1970 uh, entailed what we call a pivotal, pivotal decision, the so-called Pepke case, uh, which involved a proposal to take a chunk of Washington Park, Park on the south side and turn it into a public school building. Uh, the Illinois Supreme Court, uh, in reviewing uh, this project, uh, upheld it, said it was not, did not violate the public trust doctrine. But in the course of, of reaching this conclusion, the court made a number of dramatic changes in the public trust doctrine. First of all, it assumed without any argument that a public park that was never uh, under the lake, uh, under, the, under Lake Michigan, was never submerged land, was co covered by the public trust doctrine. Uh, secondly, it uh, held that any taxpayer in Illinois has standing to assert a violation of the public trust doctrine, not just the state attorney general. And finally, it uh, greatly expanded the purposes of the doctrine, not just, it was not just to promote public uh, access to the waters or other venues of uh, channels of commerce for uh, public uh, transport, commerce and, and so forth, but it was also designed to prevent any kind of uh, excessive transfer of public resources to private interests. And in reaching this, uh, a new conception of the purposes of the trust, the court uh, quoted uh, and relied extensively on a recent law review article by Professor Joseph Sachs of the University of Michigan Law School. So this is a rare instance in which the law took a decisive turn based on the writings of a law professor. Um, in any event, uh, the history of the public trust doctrine in Illinois since the 1970 pivot has been one in which uh, uh, it's somewhat uh, difficult to rationalize the pattern of the decisions. Uh, in some cases, the Illinois courts have been uh, quite strict about the public trust doctrine. For example, when Loyola, uh, a Catholic university on the north side of Chicago, wanted to expand its campus into the lake uh, in a kind of modest version of what Northwestern had been allowed to do, uh, the court, uh, uh, the federal court hearing the case decided that this would violate the public trust doctrine and was impermissible. Um, uh, another dramatic instance uh, was when the Illinois Supreme Court uh, 
invalidated a transfer of submerged land to expand the uh, steel mill operated by U.S. Steel on the far south side, the so-called South Works. In other cases, however, uh, the courts have been much more uh, forgiving. Uh, uh, the Chicago Bears were allowed to um, have a, uh, an expansion of Soldier Field to uh, accommodate their desires for more skyboxes, no problem. More recently, the o Obama Presidential Center, which has taken some 20 acres out of Jackson Park on the south side, uh, has been uh, deemed to be uh, consistent with the public trust doctrine. Um, but uh, uh, it's always kind of difficult to predict exactly how these cases will come out. To give uh, one particularly striking case uh, that precedes the uh, Obama Presidential Center a bit. Uh, George Lucas, the movie producer uh, 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 who has lots of money, uh, proposed that he create a foundation that would build a museum of the narrative arts on the south side, just near, near fairly near the, uh, just south of the, uh, the new Bears Stadium in the background there. Um, uh, and uh, he would pay for it and it would all be free and free of free of any obligations by the city and so forth. The city uh, politicians were all unanimously enthusiastic about this. It would create new jobs for Southsiders. It would create new tourism. It would create new tax revenues. They got uh, what they thought were all the relevant approvals. Uh, but uh, the Friends of the Parks, uh, an, an advocacy group for park preservation, didn't like the project. Uh, the Chicago Tribune didn't like the project, and so uh, the case uh, uh, went to federal court, um, and the federal judge uh, kind of slow rolled everything. Uh, the city got very irritated, filed a petition for mandamus, but before that could be resolved, uh, George Lucas got disgusted and uh, left his music, took his museum to Los Angeles, where it's scheduled to open in another year or so. Uh, so uh, I think. Uh, the Lucas case sort of illustrates, uh, in a way, the, the current status of the public trust doctrine uh, on the Chicago lakefront. Um, uh, a lot depends, uh, since every, anybody can sue, a lot depends on whether uh, some kind of advocacy group decides to sue or not. Uh, a lot depends on uh, what uh, kind of court gets the case. Uh, federal judges seem to be more strict about enforcing the doctrine than state judges do. It depends on whether we're talking about landfilling in the lake or changing the use of pre pre existed filled land or land that's just in a park contiguous to the lake. Uh, so it becomes uh, more of a political science exercise to predict these cases than a legal exercise. Um, we are uh, uh, former Chicagoans who are very uh, strongly attached to, to the idea of preserving the lakefront and uh, we agree with Chicagoans in general that it's the most treasured assets, asset that the city has. Uh, but we think that is deciding uh, what should be done with the lakefront by trial court management decisions made by an unelected federal judge is probably not the best way to uh, reach decisions that are uh, accountable and legitimate uh, in terms of the future of the lakefront. So that's all we have to say by way of introduction. Okay, well, thank you, uh, uh, Joe and Tom. And uh, now we have uh, a super expert on the public trust and uh, on Chicago, Carol Rose. Thanks, it takes me a minute to unmute. It always does, I to click the wrong button. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm not gonna say a great deal about the public trust. I do wanna say that this is a great book uh, and there's much more to it than Tom had time to uh, talk about. It, the book really managed to sort out a ton of picturesque characters and grubby wheelie dealing and this sheer luck that went into creating Chicago's wonderful le uh, lakefront. It's really one of the great urban lakefronts of the world. And this is a wonderful exposition of how it came about. I should say we're all Chicagoans here and we all have a, a great affection for uh, the lake and for its future. Uh, with all of that, um, I, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I wish the authors had said a little bit more about in the book and then another sort of quibble that I have. Um, one of the things I would like to have seen a bit more about is an aspect of Chicago history, and that is how uh, racial issues played into the lakefront development and especially the beach areas. There were major Chicago riots in 1919, and they started when an African-American kid drifted in the water into a beach area that the white kids saw as their own. Fights started, then spread through the city. 
And at the end of it, the usual number that's given is 38 people were killed uh, and a great deal of property damage was done. Uh, I can't help but think that that terrible week had some influence on the way that the, uh, the, the city and the state developed the lakefront, particularly the beach areas. So I would like to have seen a little more about that. A second thing I would like to have seen somewhat more about is the wider ramifications of the public trust doctrine outside Illinois. Uh, this is a doctrine that, as Tom just said, has really blossomed into public uh, trust claims, and they're all over the country. Uh, Illinois Central, the, the, the lakefront case is, a, is a, a crucial document and all that, much cited. Uh, and in other states, the public trust doctrine has been deployed to um, increase the public claims to the waterfront, particularly in beach areas and for recreational purposes, but for environmental purposes as well as in uh, California, which is a, a big pusher of the public trust doctrine in the Mono Lake uh, area, which is an important um, uh, uh, water body for um, uh, uh, migratory birds. Um, to some degree, the public trust has morphed into a climate change related claim of an atmospheric trust. And I just wondered what the authors thought about those developments outside Illinois. Not a great deal. They do talk about Joe Sachs, uh, who revived the Illinois Central case in the 1970s. But I would have welcomed some more comment about what Chicago's experience in the lakefront cases might have revealed or might not have revealed about those newer developments in other places. Uh, the third thing is a quibble. Um, not about something left out, but a uh, disagreement with uh, something that the authors claim as a talking point of the book. Uh, and that's, this is basically a quibble that I have with Tom. Um, it's the uh, importance of what they call possession in establishing claims to property. This is something that's uh, stated early in the book and then later in the book. The, it just, when this is just asserted flatly like this, it looks to me like the Vladimir Putin theory of uh, property rights. Um, but I think it overclaims for possession, even for the book's own examples. And let me say why. Um, what the authors call possession occurred on areas that belong to the public if they belong to anybody. Um, and for a variety of public choice reasons, the public is likely to be slow to defend its property. I won't go into all of those, but this is well discussed in much literature. Uh, things would have been different if the Illinois Central Railway had tried to, to uh, make its claims to possess some private owner's property. Uh, and in any event, the Illinois Central did have a pretty good argument that it was entitled to its operations on the lakefront. It wasn't simply a matter of occupying it. It was rather uh, based on a legislative grant uh, and as Tom noted in his talk just a minute ago, there's an old federal case, Fletcher versus Peck, that even a corrupt grant can be taken back by the legislature. Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. Uh, let me take a sip here. I'm not sure that's gonna help. Uh, there's another point though too, and that's in a part of the book that talks about the Streeterville area around North Michigan Avenue. Now a very highly developed uh, area near Michigan Avenue's North Miracle Mile, uh, and it's uh, 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 extremely valuable property now. This started when um, a um, a squatter, a notorious squatter uh, named Joseph Well, or George Wellington Streeter, uh, just more or less camped out there and started to fill more. Um, and um, but as the book says. Most people at that time thought the lakefront was, as the book says, up for grabs. That is, people thought that there were no well-established claims. And the big problem here is that the book isn't really clear on what possession means. With Streeterville, the first one to claim possession was this notorious squatter, Streeter. But he didn't get any property rights out of it. He did get the name, but he didn't get any property rights out of it. And instead, he lost out to the nearby landowners. That second tier of landowner uh, uh, possessors, they didn't. They started some uh, substantial construction, but they really didn't uh, do much with the area, as the book points out, until they got support for a claim of legal right, and that was the claim of uh, that gave them legitimacy uh, to go ahead and develop the area. And I think 
I, my question is, where does that leave possession as a claim? And as I said earlier, this is a kind of a quarrel between Tom and me. Tom keeps saying that I say that title trumps possession, but I don't think that. What I think is that what we mean by possession normally isn't just physical occupancy. Instead, what people mean by possession is something that gives off signs that most people think is a legitimate claim. When things are up for grabs and there isn't any certainty about who owns what, then yes, it's okay to be the first one to grab. Firstness gives a kind of claim then. There are other things that give a kind of claim though as well, like owning other property nearby, as in the case of that second tier of possessors in Streeterville. Uh, Thomas talked about this as the principle of accession. Another claim is just doing the most work, a kind of a Lockean claim. Uh, and which again speaks to some degree for the second tier when they started putting up some substantial structures. Or in some countries it can just be having the right status. So yes, the lakefront properties did get taken and that second tier of takers got their, uh, their area. But it all started at a time when most people thought that the lakefront was up for grabs. Otherwise, I, at that point, grabbing is acceptable, but if it uh, isn't acceptable, then it's just the Vladimir Putin theory. Take it and it's yours, no matter who owned it. And nobody really thinks that that theory works out very well for a property regime. So I was a little sorry to see this talking point come up a couple of times in the book, but I have talked too much about this uh, point of personal grievance. Uh, so uh, and indeed everything else in the book too. That none of that should take away from the achievement of this book, which is a spectacular piece of research and a spectacular piece of exposition of, a, of one of the world's greatest uh, waterfront areas. So uh, I said so on the book jacket and every word is true. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, and. Uh, now we turn uh, to another uh, expert on uh, the public trust and environmental law, our uh, Richard Lazarus. So take it away. Um, thanks, Henry. So um, I don't have quibbles. I actually just love the book. Um, I like this book so much, actually, I feel a little guilty about it. Uh, it's as though Joe and Tom spent 20 years of their lives writing a book just for me. Um, so I'm going to talk about three topics. One, uh, why this topic was so personally, professionally important to me. Uh, second, uh, what makes this book, I think, so extraordinary? Uh, and third, quickly, uh, my favorite parts. Uh, so first, why the book sort of spoke to me personally, professionally. Uh, first, personally, as, as Tom knows, because he actually visited me there once, I grew up in central Illinois, about 120 miles south of the Chicago lakefront. We don't have any water bodies there. Um, uh, but uh, I don't think Tom knows this. My grandparents, who I visited frequently as a child, lived in Chicago. They lived on 215 East Chestnut. Chestnut. Uh, I would stay there for weeks sometimes as a, as a kid. They had a teeny apartment between Michigan Avenue and Lakeshore Drive. And my childhood was in a day with memories of walking the streets and neighborhoods of that area, the lakefront. I now know from Tom and Joe, that's Streeterville uh, with an utterly fascinating, eye-popping history, uh, which Carol touched on. And I'm gonna mention a little bit more later. Uh, professionally, uh, the book is a, uh, is a bullseye for me. Uh, the title says it all, Lakefront. Uh, many of the most important environmental natural resource law cases, what I write about, what I teach about, the past 150 years are where land meets water. And that's no happenstance. Uh, that is where there's a persistent clash of legal regimes. One rooted in notions of absolute private property rights in land, uh, other notions of public rights and common resources like water, which Carol has written uh, quite beautifully about. Where land meets water is of enormous economic value for manufacturing, electricity, transportation, real estate, but simultaneously where land meets water is of enormous public value and ecological value. The physical access to water resources, public enjoyment, uh, protection of water quality, um, prevention of flooding, uh, protection of wildlife, uh, uh, marine life, protection of, of fragile uh, ecosystems. Um, it's no happenstance, the most every single regulatory taking issue the past 50 years occurs where land meets water. Uh, extending back, of course, in some ways, of the contract clause to the uh, Illinois Central case. And there's no case more famous or mysterious 
uh, than that ruling, which is the focus or it's the centerpiece of this book, Illinois Central Railroad uh, v. Illinois. Uh, it's a fountainhead uh, idea that public rights prevail, that collision occurs from public access to beaches, the limitation of private property rights, including water, uh, which Carol mentioned, um, the Mono Lake case, which actually I argued in front of the California Supreme Court, uh, even now to novel suggestions of atmospheric trust and global climate change, which Carol also mentioned a moment ago. But the Illinois Central's bizarre facts always suggest to me when I first read it, there was far more here uh, than appeared on the pages of the U.S. reports. How exactly did the state of Illinois convey such a massive amount of lakefront to a railroad? Who pulled that off? And then how did the legislature just a few years later take it back? There was, as Justice Sotomayor might say, a bit of stench about the whole thing. Uh, the kind of thing you would actually think would make the case sort of a sport, um, a one-off, rather than a case that has flourished and spread like wildfire uh, in the state courts across, across the country. Uh, and thanks, uh, as I think Tom mentioned, Carol did too, thanks really to Joe Sachs for unlikely a, a, a law review article uh, that instead created a cult-like following uh, for now half a century. All right, so what makes the book, I think, so extraordinary? Well, lots of people have written about the Illinois Central cases. Hundreds of law professors, students have written hundreds of law review articles. Uh, law reviews are littered with them. I wrote, I wrote one. Um, uh, but Joe and Tom did something no one else had done. They actually dove in the archival record, which is why I was so excited about this when Tom told me a while ago. They decided to find out exactly what happened, the events leading up to the case, the events surrounding the case, and what has happened over the last sort of 130 years. Uh, it's a great story. Uh, it should be a Netflix uh, series, probably will be. Um, and they solved what, for me, had always been the case's biggest mysteries. First, why did Illinois legislature do this in the first instance? Second, then why did they take it back? And third, why did Justice Field rely on the public trust doctrine rather than a narrow ground, which was readily supplied by the lower court, actually an opinion written, interestingly, by uh, Justice Harlan. Um, so on the first, why the conveyance? Uh, and this is where they just pour through these archival, archival documents. I love archival documents. I'm very jealous of them. Uh, for, and they showed that those documents supported, did not demand, but supported long-held assumptions that corrupt payments were made. The, the lobbyist dining room, uh, Dr. Alonzo Mack, uh, they described the table he sat at, uh, the norms of the times, uh, the impressive accuracy uh, of Dr. Mack's vote counting. Uh, and how lobbying was done back then. But they also told a more nuanced story uh, beyond corruption about the downstate upstate divide and how up downstate interests were different than upstate interests. And that rang very true to me, that um, possible explanation as someone from, from downstate Illinois. On the second, uh, why the repeal? Um, it was interesting to see uh, partly personality. Dr. Mack was gone a few years later, he died. Uh, and then why the Illinois Central did not fight the repeal really that hard. And that was called because they were threatened uh, by legislative investigations of uncovering corruption. Uh, finally, the mystery of the Illinois Central decision itself. I think how it was partly the bad result of bad lawyering. Uh, the decision of the Illinois Central to seek Supreme Court review from a lower court ruling, which actually wasn't a bad ruling uh, for them. It was a ruling which they had won most everything uh, they needed. Uh, and then a decision by their lawyers not to respond to the public trust doctrine arguments made by the opposing counsel. That was partly a result of Justice Field's jurisprudential bent, a uh, Jacksonian Democrat and his roots and his long standing suspicion uh, of business corrupting uh, legislatures, which caused him to go beyond what Justice Harlan had done. Uh, and finally, I want to point out that it was a product of Illinois Central's poor behavior. In the beginning, they were just trying to protect their existing investments, then they got greedy. Uh, and they sought uh, rights to the Outer Harbor, and they became more of a bully oh, over time, and that, that backfired. All right, finally, my favorite parts. Uh, for me, my favorite parts are always people. I'm just gonna mention three. Uh, one, uh, Dr. Alonzo Mack. 
uh, the only central lawyer I already mentioned a moment ago, an amazing character. Uh, but then beating him out uh, is the elusive Aaron Montgomery Ward. Uh, this is the individual who played an outsized role in defining what, what the lakeshore area looks like, the lakefront south of the Chicago River. Born in poverty, a shop clerk, a traveling salesman, he's one of conceived of catalog sales and became obviously Montgomery Ward, uh, the largest retailer in the nation. Um, he built his headquarters on the west side of Michigan Avenue, right south of the Chicago River, and then he became the protector of that whole area. And he had a lot of money to do it. Uh, and he staved off effort after effort to develop that property. That's why there's a beautiful uh, park there. He was the watchdog of the lakefront. Uh, he took advantage of legally binding public dedications. Um, if he hadn't been there, probably wouldn't have been a champion who would have bothered to bring all those lawsuits. He fought with no less than Marshall Field uh, and fought off the Field Museum to be there. And that's why it's much further to the south. Um, he kept the Grant Park building free. He allowed the Art Institute uh, with another person uh, named Sarah Daggett. Uh, he allowed the Buckingham Fountain. Um, and he allowed finally the, uh, the Field Museum, but way, way down south, which is why it's there. The planetarium is there and the aquarium is there. He even managed to stop an effort um, by the city to have condemnation, uh, somehow convincing the court, which I don't find very convincing. Uh, they couldn't do eminent domain uh, of areas that were uh, subject uh, to these public uh, dedication. All right, but the last person of all, the best by far, alluded to briefly uh, by Carol, was Captain George Wellington Street uh, and Streeterville, the area north of Chicago River, which today looks nothing like the area south of the Chicago River. A very different history. Um, Captain Streeter, I knew none of this. You have to, couldn't make this stuff up. So Captain Streeter, according to the book, builds a steamboat in 1886 in a gale, I gather. Uh, he is forced uh, to shore uh, near what's now Superior uh, Street, just north of the Chicago River. And then he proceeds to make his rounded boat a home. Uh, he builds a makeshift fortress. He claims ownership of hundreds of acres called Streeterville, of which, as Carol pointed out, he never really gets, but he manages to sell it to other people nonetheless. He murders people. He and his gang have bloody shootout battles with the police. Uh, he kind of reminds me of the Donald Trump of his day. Um, he was a wily scoundrel of an individual who was popular. And then, in a way that is, uh, rings for me, uh, he eventually moved to a small brick store on guess what street? Chestnut Street exactly the street that I knew as a small child. Uh, he and Ma Streeter uh, sold sandwiches, soda pop, liquor, his autobiography. Uh, he doesn't die till like 1923. Uh, so he's there occupying this area off and on when he's not in prison for a few years, for almost 40 years. But here's the book, you should buy it. But I would buy the book just for this. Uh, I'd buy the book just for this one thing. And that is the picture of Captain Streeter and Ma Streeter. Um, and and uh, you know, there they are. I mean, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> that guy is, he looks, you couldn't look at him. It's just like central casting uh, for a wily scoundrel uh, of the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. I love archival research. Uh, my only complaint quibble with them is they got to this research and I didn't. Um, I, being in those archives, what fun. Uh, that must have been. Great. Thank you, uh, Richard. Um, and, and I will say, uh, everybody here is a Chicagoan. I grew up there. Uh, I uh, taught there at Northwestern with Tom. Uh, so uh, I'm very familiar with it. And, and I, I just want to say uh, two sentences. Um, and this is sort of directed at students. I, I highly recommend this book. Um, buy it or take it out from the library, or uh, I know that the authors don't want to hear that, but um, basically uh, this book I think is a very good corrective to the kind of mentality we have in law schools. Uh, you know, the public trust is either apple pie because it's in the public interest or it's so uncertain and it's uh, overrides property rights uh, in effect and so forth. Uh, and the picture here is totally different. Uh, it's, uh, as the speakers have said, there, there was all this, uh, there indeed was uncertainty and doctrinal mess, human folly here and there. Uh, 
Uh, and a theme of the book is that uh, it's one elite group against another and which elite group comes out on top, all the kind of things that, uh, you know, we don't necessarily always want to think about. And yet we have this beautiful uh, waterfront, uh, the lakefront, and the result is, uh, is something that every person here has applauded. Uh, and so the mismatch between how we got here and where we wound up uh, is, I think, a very important one. It, uh, it's a Chicago story, but maybe it's also a uh, a human nature story or a politics story. It, it's a, it's really a truly uh, fascinating uh, book. And I do uh, think that the idea of a, a Netflix uh, um, movie would be a, a good idea. So uh, with that, uh, I think we, we are actually at the time when a uh, question and answer should start. Uh, I will, uh, the um, uh, maybe two minutes uh, is the time that uh, Joe and Tom uh, kind of reserved for themselves, uh, but we can go straight to question and answer too. So it's up to you. I'm not quite sure how Tom would respond to being Vladimir Putin. Uh, so maybe we should go straight <laughs> to the questions. Okay, so I have a question here. So the, as uh, uh, it was announced, you can type the questions into uh, the question and answer uh, box. So the first question is, uh, the lake is suffering a lot under climate change, uh, temperature change, invasive species, eroding shorelines. What role will slash should the public trust doctrine play in addressing the lake's environmental concerns? Uh, you want me to try to answer that? Briefly, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yes, there, the invasive species problem is a huge one. Uh, whether uh, the lake is rising or falling is harder to say. Um, the lake goes up and down by about two feet per year at the ma maximum in sort of uh, long-term cycles, which no one can entirely figure out. Uh, uh, the inv invasive species problem is largely a function of the fact that the uh, Great Lakes have been opened up to the, the St. Lawrence Seaway in the east and also to the, to the um, Mississippi and Illinois rivers from the south because of the uh, reversal of the Chicago River, uh, creating an opening there. Um, and uh, it's been kind of a chaotic story ever since these openings occurred. You know, various species proliferate and all of a sudden everybody's out there, you know, uh, fishing for uh, salmon and then the next thing the salmon disappear and there's nothing left for them and so forth. The big concern now are the carp that might be coming in from uh, the south. Uh, there's an electronic barrier set up by the Army Corps of Engineers, but there's mixed views as to whether this is going to succeed or not. So that's a huge environmental uh, issue uh, for the Great Lakes. Climate change, you know, it's harder to say that climate change is going to directly affect the Great Lakes the way it will, uh, you know, oceanfront property uh, if all the predictions prove to be accurate. The public trust doctrine I don't see is playing much of a role uh, on any of these sort of more conventionally described environmental uh, issues. Okay, we have a question from uh, David Wilkins. Uh, uh, he says, as a Chicagoan born and bred, I'm looking forward to reading this book. I, I'm interested in what this has meant for two developments linked by family, but separated by generation. Uh, generations. His Honor Richard J. Daly's thwarted attempt to build an airport in the lake and Richie Jr.'s development of the 39th Street Harbor and the development of the south side of the lake. Hmm. Well, the um, mayor, uh, the senior Daly's attempt to, or plan to build a uh, airport in the lake, I think, uh, played a significant role in galvanizing the environmental movement in Chicago. Uh, it was truly a kind of mind boggling plan. It was going to be you know, a huge airport bigger than O'Hare uh, on landfill out in the middle of the lake in order to accommodate supersonic jet transport planes. Uh, and the environmental movement was just getting going on the south side in Chicago and the Chicago, Chicago environmental movement, of course, thought this was a crazy idea. It was a crazy idea. Uh, um, and that helped, I think, build support for greater protection of the lakefront, greater protection for natural resources. And uh, so it did play um, a, a critical uh, role. Um, I'm less familiar with the 39th Street Harbor that you're talking about. Uh, the south side in general uh, along the lakefront has been greatly impoverished in terms of uh, facilities relative to the north side uh, for reasons that you know one can only speculate about. The north side had harbors, sailing clubs, golf courses, all sorts of stuff as, as the Lakeshore Drive was built out to the north. 
the south side was relatively bare, uh, you know, sparse, not a lot of landscaping, a really thin park. Uh, and of course, the demographics of the south side were quite different from the north side. So maybe that is a somewhat of an exp explanation. More recently, uh, efforts are being made to improve the park on the south side, uh, including, I guess, adding some harbor facilities. Uh, 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 again, it's interesting that when uh, a park district wants to gauge in landfilling uh, pursuant to legislative authorization, there's even today, there's very little controversy about it. It's, it's when uh, it's when you start getting landfilling by unauthorized persons or private entities that uh, uh, all, the, all the controversy erupts. So we're, we're at the end of the queue for the time being. And I was wondering if you could uh, address uh, a point uh, from uh, Carol and from Richard, uh, namely uh, the implications of this for the public trust doctrine as a standard, because it varies a lot by uh, jurisdictions, and to what extent you see it as uh, extending, you know, will extend, should extend uh, to resources that are not so clearly tied to water. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, because of the Supreme Court's 1894 decision to leave the details of the public trust up to each state, we have a kind of natural experiment now in which uh, we have different versions of the public trust doctrine in different states. Um, um, uh, the Illinois version, I think, is not to be emulated very uh, enthusiastically because it's largely become a sort of litigation-based doctrine. You know, uh, various groups go to court and then you try to get a judicial judgment, a thumbs up or thumbs down about various things that they either like or don't like on the lakefront. Um, um, and, I, you know, this is not, I think, um, the best way to handle these controversies. Other states, I think I'd cite Wisconsin as an example. Uh, Wisconsin has a constant state constitutional provision which uh, protects uh, public rights of access to navigable waters that flow into the Mississippi or the St. Lawrence rivers. And um, that's been interpreted in Wisconsin as giving authority to the state to delegate a power to the Na Department of Natural Resources to monitor all the waters in the state, uh, groundwaters as well as uh, non-navigable waters, insofar as they implicate the uh, level of the waters in, in navigable streams and lakes and so forth. And this has sort of created a kind of administrative body uh, with expertise and there's judicial review under sort of standard administrative uh, standards of judicial review. Um, and until recently, I guess recently it's kind of bollocked, Joe knows more about this than I do, bollocked up by the politics involving the Wisconsin judiciary and so forth, but uh, it seemed to work pretty well. It was kind of a, it was kind of what Joe Sachs wanted, which was sort of an administrative body, uh, administrative mechanism that would allow for public input and some kind of serious, you know, expert driven decision making about these water issues uh, subject to some kind of uh, standard administrative law review. Uh, other states, uh, you know, California, uh, seems to have a kind of mixture of Illinois uh, and, and Wisconsin, where uh, I guess, thanks to Richard, they have the judicial vetoes over <laughs> diversions of water uh, for thirsty Los Angeles uh, residents uh, at, uh, at the expense of uh, seabirds in Lake Mono Lake and so forth. Um, uh, so that's kind of a mixture of a tidal theory with a kind of a focus on, uh, on, on inputs to navigable bodies of water. Hawaii's got a totally different scheme, again, based on the state constitution uh, that protects uh, groundwater and also is protect some native Hawaiian rights. New York, I think, has got a pretty good system, uh, which is just a kind of a second look requirement that, you know, if you want to close a park or you want to close a wilderness area, you have to get express permission from the state legislature, which allows people that are aggrieved by these decisions to go and, you know, get another body of uh, politically accountable people to look at it. And, and frequently that has served as an effective check on uh, transferring park land and, and so forth uh, to uh, private uses. So different versions in different states, I think uh, uh, there's been some comparative work on the public trust doctrine, but I think uh, more would be in order to sort of try to, I, I, I agree with the comments of both Carol and Richard that, you know, uh, a deeper dive into this, uh, these uh, the sort of internal comparative law that we have in the United States about the public trust doctrine would be quite illuminating. Great. Now, I think we're uh, at the stage where we could have about five minutes of free for all. So uh, that's an invitation to Carol and Richard to jump back in and uh, uh, go for it.
just one very quick thing, Tom. I think once again, you've overestimated me. Um, uh, and that is you assumed who I was representing in the Mono Lake case. Um, I, oh. was represent, I was representing the United States uh, okay. in that case. Uh, and what position but, did you take? Uh, we took the position more of an administrative law position. Uh, and we also, of course, took the position, not surprisingly, uh, that they couldn't limit the repairing rights of the United States uh, oh, right, next yeah. to their, uh, their ownership of Forest Service property uh, in, uh, in California. But we took more of the notion of the state had authority, but less for the courts and more for the, the government. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, one, uh, one thing that I had thought was going to happen with the public trust doctrine back when I did something on this well, now 40 years ago, I, I had thought that the public trust doctrine might expand into telecommunications uh, and uh, because the historical public trust had to do with waterways, roads to some degree, uh, ways that people got around, transportation, commercial uses, Recreation is a part of a bit kind of a latecomer, but I thought the the expansion of the doctrine would be to, in communications, uh, and that just has not happened. And it's uh, there are other things that have happened, but that's not one of them. So that was um, that was a guess of mine that uh, did not come true. I um, it wasn't a major guess, but it was something that I thought might might happen, and it didn't. And I just have a quick question for Tom and Joe. If they do. One thing that I've been curious about, I don't remember being touched on in the book, is since the court said a few years after Illinois Central was a question of, of, of state law, then what were they doing in Illinois Central? In other words, what business did they have saying what Illinois law was? It's a huge mystery because Justice Field actually authored an opinion a few years before the Illinois Central case, which acknowledged that Illinois uh, had recognized that the uh, private ownership of <laughs> uh, submerged lands was the universal rule in Illinois. I mean, he knows what Illinois law is. He just doesn't say anything about it in the, uh, in the Illinois Central case. Um, uh, I think a decent argument could have been made for federal uh, basis for the public trust doctrine. You know, you've got the Commerce Clause, and then you've got the recognition that, you know, the federal courts have inherent authority to enjoin uh, obstructions to interstate commerce on rivers. Uh, and you, that was a sort of a small step from that to saying that, you know, the federal courts pursuant to this implied limitation on the state land, state grants, state, statehood grants, uh, could overturn you know, breaches of the public trust that might interfere with public access to navigable waters. And then you would have had a federal doctrine that would be uniform across the country and the sort of derivative of the Dormant Commerce Clause. But it didn't happen. You know, it was like, I think the court by 1894 was sort of overwhelmed with the diversity of issues raised by this idea of a public trust. And they, uh, uh, you know, in Schneively versus Bowlby, they decided to beat a retreat and just let the states muck around with this. Yeah, because there certainly wasn't, wasn't a, a hint in Illinois Central that it was Illinois law. Right. It, yeah. was, no, a, yeah, no. it was a less precise error more generally. We make the point in the book that under modern federal question doctrine, as far back as the early 20th century, the case could not have originated as it did in federal court. Henry, if I can yeah, have okay. a minute uh, before we conclude. Yeah, so if you, you'll take a minute and then uh, Jocelyn gets a minute. So that's where we are. So okay. yeah, take one minute. Terrific. I simply, in addition to thanking everyone for both Tom and myself, want to say that in addition to its being a Chicago story and a human story, it's also in its origins really a legal education story. For me at Marquette, it's the fact that we deployed a really substantial number of research assistants over a two decade period. We didn't do quite the amount of archival research ourselves that Richard credits us with. But I think uh, more importantly, perhaps for any students who may be here, the real origin of the book is in legal education rather directly. I invited myself in in my first year teaching in 1997, when I was visiting Tom down at Northwestern and asked him what he might work on someday. And we spent the next 23 years on this among many other things. But Tom had been thinking about it for 23 years, uh, ever since Professor Allison Dunham at the University of Chicago in his first year property class 
uh, said something about the Chicago lakefront that Tom questioned or doubted. And so for any students here, uh, be careful about any doubts that you have about anything your professor says. You might find yourself uh, 49 years later having spent a couple of decades on a book uh, just to elaborate the point. And a very last point, and it's on my mind partly because I got the note from Dean Manning uh, last month about Lloyd Weinrebs having passed away. And he was my first year criminal law professor whom I really much admired. So legal education is always on my mind, but maybe especially in this context. Yeah, for all of us, that's true. Uh, so now uh, I would like to thank all of the uh, speakers. This was a wonderful discussion. Uh, and I will turn it over to Jocelyn to wrap things up. I'm actually going to steal it from Jocelyn. Um, okay. So uh, uh, on behalf of the library, thank you, Dean Carney, Professor Merrill, Professor Rose, and Professor Lazarus for joining today. Uh, thank you as well to Professor Smith for moderating. And, and thank you all for sharing your insight. Um, thank you again to the Dean's Office for their continued support, and thank you to our audience for joining and for your thoughtful questions. Um, I I'd like to give a brief announcement for our next book talk. Our next book talk will be on Tuesday, March 8th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time uh, for Vice Patrol, Cops, Courts, and the Struggle for Urban Gay Life Before Stonewall by Harvard Law Professor Anna Lubovsky. You can read more about the book and register for the event on the library website. Uh, so thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>